Father, we are here not because we're good, but because we're yours. You know every person in this place. Come yourself. May we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. And as always, Father, we pray for the one who teaches, forgive him his sins, because they are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I spend spending a lot of time with a prostitute this week. And it's not what you think. Kevin assigned me as a part of the Advent series, the fifth verse of the first chapter of Matthew, and that's the genealogy of Jesus. And that verse reads, and Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. Frankly, when Kevin gave out these topics, I was kind of hurt that he gave me the prostitute. And then I listened to Kevin's sermon last Sunday, dynamite sermon, absolute. We are so fortunate to have him. He loves us, and I don't know why. And uh, his preaching is amazing. And last, last Sunday, he took Tamar. And man, you talk about a wicked family. That's even, In fact, Tamar makes my prostitute look like a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> and Kathy, who's up in the booth, said that this is a series about the bad girls and the Advent narrative. They're all bad, except one, Ruth. Kevin gave her to Drew. <laughs> Which I think was a statement. Rahab is mentioned in four places in the Bible, and one of them is kind of troublesome, so I'm going to take just a little bit of time with that. It's the second chapter of James in the 24th of the 25th verse, where James says that Rahab, or James asks by way of a question, did not Rahab's works justify her? As you may or may not know, Martin Luther said the book of James was an epistle of straw, and if he had had his way, he would have exorcised it from the canon. The thing that bothered him was James saying, faith without works is dead. Now, it takes a high degree of arrogance, and I know it, to say that Martin Luther was wrong. He didn't understand a principle, and the principle is this. When you hit on a place in Scripture, a verse or a text, and it contradicts everything you know about the whole counsel of God, you don't junk the whole counsel of God, you dig deeper. So I dug deeper. And so what James is doing, and he didn't say it well, he needed a good editor. Inerrancy in Scripture doesn't mean that it's spoken with eloquence, just that it's true. So he could have said it better. But he was commenting on what happens when grace begins to permeate your life. And it does. Listen, some good things happened to Rahab. She was in the genealogy of Jesus. There were eight major prophets, a part of her family. 
She's never mentioned in the genealogies of the Old Testament. And as Kevin said, that was a cultural thing, but I think it was more than that. I think our Old Testament family said, leave her out. That's unseemly. But what about Ruth and Boaz? So faith does stuff. You got faith, it does stuff. For some, it does a lot of stuff, Mother Teresa. For others, me, for example, it doesn't do much. But listen to me. The Bible teaches that it doesn't matter. That faith is accounted as righteousness. And so when James is talking, he's not doing anything but commenting, and he asks a question about Rahab. And the obvious answer, if you know the scripture, is of course not. All right, we could spend a lot of time on that, but I want to go to Joshua and the second chapter of Joshua. You're aware of what's going on in that story. Joshua has taken two spies and he sent them to Jericho. To spy out the land before the war began. And for some reason, they hooked up with Rahab, the prostitute. And they were staying in her house. The king heard about it and called Rahab to the court and asked about the spies. And her answer was, what spies? The king pushed her because he knew. And this is what she said, I have no idea who they are. They showed up at my house and I sent them away. And I don't, that's all I know. So Rahab was not only a whore, she was a liar. And not only was she that, she was a traitor to her country. And not only that, she was a part of the enemy of God's people. Now, if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Joshua. No, don't do it unless you're a Baptist. You'll never find it before I finish it. Let me read to you the rest of the story. Starting at the 8th verse in the 2nd chapter. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water in the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God. God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And then I want to go, and then we'll get down. I want to go to one other place, and that's the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. That is a great chapter. And Jesus, good night. I just want you to know, Kevin, I will sue this place if I fall.
No, no. When you're, re- when you're really old and you trip, everybody goes, ah. I sometimes think I'm just going to fall and get all that symphony, uh, sympathy and all the money when I sued the church for having caused this to me. What was I saying? Oh, 11th chapter of Hebrews. 11th chapter of Hebrews does not use the name of Jesus. It uses faith all over the place, and it tells the heroes, many of the martyrs who had died and were justified because their faith. And then as you read through Hebrews, you note that Rahab, Rahab, the prostitute, is in the middle of it. And then when you get to the 12th chapter of Hebrews, it says, therefore... Since we are surrounded, like Abraham says, I was screwed up too. Don't you shilly-shally, don't you back off. And Moses, God wouldn't even let me into the promised land, so you stay with it, okay? Since we are surrounded, Rahab, you talk about messed up. You're a sinner, you don't know nothing. Don't you give up, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, lay us, let us lay aside those things that hinder us and get on about the walk to which Jesus has called us. And so you got Rahab. Do you know that everybody is religious? <laughs> it's no surprise that you're here. And if you weren't here, you would be in another church, worshiping in a different way. And if you were not in any church, you would be worshiping a different God. Pascal said that we have a God-shaped vacuum, and nothing fits in that vacuum. As an aside, if if you've noticed the social movements of our time, their anger, their combination, con- condemnation, it's the microphone, the guilt-producing stuff they're laying out, you know what they sound like? And that's because they are. They sound like angry, crazy fundamentalists. As somebody said, when you no longer worship the true God, you don't worship nothing, you worship anything. But going back to what I was saying, we're religious people. It's in our DNA. Religion starts with a man or a woman, and then it becomes a movement, and then it becomes an institution, and then from that institution there's a hardening of ecclesiastical arteries, and things go awry. I'm not upset that the pagans have taken Jesus out of Christmas, frankly. What upsets me is that Christians have sanitized Jesus until the reality and the power and the astonishment of what happened is no longer astonishing. If you're familiar with the 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus goes back to his hometown Can't go home again, but he tried. And when he got there, Matthew says he couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Where did the unbelief come from? It came from the sanitizing, the closeness. If If you've been a Christian for a long time, listen to me, you're in a dangerous place. If you're a covenant child and have always known what it's like to be a part of the covenant community, you're in a dangerous place and you have to be very careful. You know why? Because it comes familiar and we're not astonished anymore. God is counterintuitive. I mean... As you read the Bible on every page, you think, I don't believe I'd have said that. 
I don't believe I would have done that. I can't believe this. <gasps> Look at that. And that's what Christmas is about. I mean, what kind of God comes as a baby in a stable? I get messiahs and armies wiping out nations, standing for a baby? If that's not astonishing to you, you need to repent. You've been a Christian for too long. The smell of manure, shepherds. If that doesn't astonish you, you've got to repent. But listen, let me tell you something. You throw a whore in there, and you've got astonishment on steroids. And so, let me, let me show you some things about Rahab. When you mix the Advent story and Christmas with Rahab, it changes things. For instance, it changes the God we thought we knew. You don't know her name. It's Mrs. Monty. She taught me how to read. When I was a kid, and I still struggle with it sometimes, I struggled with dyslexia and couldn't read worth dink. And Mrs. Monty, in her kindness and her love and her patience, taught me how to read. It was an amazing gift. And every time I went back home, I thanked her for it. I read three or four books a week. I love to read. It's my favorite thing in the world. And every time I open a book, I think about Mrs. Monty. But Mrs. Monty was different. <laughs> Her pedagogy was skewed, skewed somewhat. Snowflakes didn't like her. <laughs> she, she started the first day by scaring the spit out of students. I mean, she came over mean as a snake. She had a rod, and it was clear that she was willing to use it. You didn't want to mess with her. You'd get on her poison list, and you would die. And, man, students were sitting down in their seats and thinking, good night. And then once she got your attention, and it took about a week, she turned nice and kind and loving. <laughs> and my kid brother, four years under me, had Mrs. Monty for the class. And the first day home, he said to our mother, Mom, <clears throat> are you sure that's the same Mrs. Monty that Steve talks about. Our view of God's kind of like that. Our experience determines it. If you had parents who coddled you and told you how wonderful you are, you think, you think God is Santa Claus, and he's not. Scary. If you've sat under preachers and teachers who talked about holiness without talking about grace, you're afraid to get out of line. You can't break any rules because if you do, you'll get cancer. If you, if you, uh, if you look, if you've been abused when you were a kid, you think of your heavenly father as an abuser. And then all of a sudden, the real God shows. And he's so different than what we thought. That's what Christmas is about. In fact, that's what Rahab is all about. Um, Andrew Bauman is a friend of mine. He's just written a book called, and I love the title, Stumbling Toward Wholeness. He was a student at RTS. And he lived, some of you knew him uh, before he moved to Tennessee, with Jim Cofield, one of the, the professors in the counseling department. Um, when Jim and, and Andrew was out of the box, still is, he's still a little crazy, 
Jim invited him to come and live with, uh, in their home with he and Mona. And Andrew told us on the interview, and he said it in his book, I think, he said, he said you know, I thought, I ain't doing that. What if, um, what if I screw it up really bad? What if, I, what if I do something that just brings shame on the Cofields? Won't it hurt the seminary and their reputation? I don't think I can do that. What if it, and about that time, Jim called. Jim said to Andrew, you've been thinking about my offer. What are you going to do? And uh, Andrew said, Jim, Dr. Cofield, that just blows me away. I, I can't tell you. And then he said, but what, what if I mess it up? What if I do something really, really bad? And Jim began to laugh. And he said, Andrew, I made up my mind about you a long time ago. How would you live if you knew that God had made up his mind about you a long time ago? No matter what you do. No matter how much you screw up, what you drink or smoke, who you're sleeping with, how many you hurt, the lies you told. What if, what if God said, I know, but I made up my mind about you a long time ago. That's the real God. He's scary. Don't anybody kid you. He's holy. That'll burn your socks off but he made up his mind about you a long, that's the real, the real God. Let me show you something else. When you put Rahab in the Advent narrative and the Christmas narrative, it changes what we thought about the people that God loves. I don't want to belabor it. I pretty much said it in the first point. And Kevin said it one, I was in tears last Sunday. It was an amazing sermon. He said it right. God loves sinners. God loves people who can't get it straight. God loves people with secrets they can't share. God loves people with pain they dare not reveal. That's the people God loves. But there's something else that I want to add, and it doesn't need much addition because it was said so well last week. I want to I wanna tell you what I do, and maybe you do too. Sometimes I'm a fair, I vote. I'm not doing at least any sins I'm going to tell you about. I, I, you know, I'm too old. Uh, when you're old, you get better. And so, and so I, sometimes I think, well, I'm in church most Sundays, and I write religious books, and I do religious broadcasts. I'm not good, but, and God loves me. But those other people who don't do all that stuff, who aren't like me, God, the message of the Christian faith is that God loves them too. No, that's not the message of the Christian faith. I had a student, I wish I could remember his name because I'd like to give him credit. But he and a friend were in downtown Orlando when a street preacher with a big black Bible was preaching. And a woman in a tight red dress walked by. And um, the preacher stopped preaching, and he pointed his finger at her and said, Whore, repent. And my student said to his friend, We're all whores. I just, I just don't know how to say it in a way that we can understand. That's the message. The message is that God 
loves sinners. And Paul said, I am, not was, or used to be, or got my act cleaned up. I am the chief of sinners. When you get that, then you get the gospel. Something else. When you put Rahab in the Advent narrative, the Christmas story, it, it changes the judgment you thought you deserved. <laughs> Boy, Art DeMoss started that saying, and now everybody says it. How you doing? Doing better than I deserve. Duh. We all know that. If we, if we got what we deserved, we would get nothing. That 11th chapter of Hebrews to which I spoke or referenced earlier has a wonderful way the writer of Hebrews lands the plane. He names all of these Old Testament personages, some of them better than others, some of them awful like Rahab, some of them dying as martyrs, and then he says something that is wonderful. These all died in faith, not having received what was promised. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That's a personal eschaton, but there's a worldwide eschaton too. Did you, did you hear about the man who was rummaging through his attic and, um, and he found a claim check for a pair of shoes that was 23 years old? And he looked at it and thought, I wonder whatever happened to those shoes. And he said, I wonder if that cobbler's still around. And he checked, and the little shoe shop, cobbler's shop, was still there. So he took the claim check, went into the cobbler's shop, and this old cobbler came out. He gave him the check. And the cobbler said, wait just a minute. And he went back into the back. A couple of minutes later, he came out. He said, they'll be ready on Thursday. <laughs> You're, you ever feel that about Jesus' return? You know, it's been a long time, and it's getting worse. Never seen so much hatred, and people are, people are crazy. Doesn't look like you're getting closer, and doesn't look like we're bringing in the kingdom much. And he says, as he said to the saints under the altar in Revelation, be still. Wait and watch. That's our hope. You can hang your hat on it. Personal eschaton and the eschatology of the kingdom. One other thing, and then we're out of here. When you, when you put Rahab, the prostitute and the liar and the traitor and the enemy, into the Christmas revelation... The Advent narrative, uh, it changes everything we thought about the nature of our witness to the world. I have a friend who's a politician. I know. You shouldn't tell people that. But I do, and I love him a lot. He uh, has been through, well, hell for the last two years, family-wise, business-wise. And he was accused of corruption just before his election. He didn't do it. He was exonerated after the election. Once his reputation had been destroyed, his life had come to an end. It's been awful, and, and he would tell you this, that it's been the best time of his life. He's gone deeper, and he's more profound than you can imagine. Let me read to you something, and it's quite beautiful, that he wrote to me recently. I have barely survived depression at times. 
Their nights so dark, they wolf down my days. All fangs and barred teeth under a moon thick as a lemon wedge bobbing in a sky full of sweet tea. But all I taste is bitter. And even still, I thirst. My tongue has been long trained by Sunday school etiquette and polite society never to cough up unpalatable words like depression or suicide or antidepressant in church company. Fine becomes my answer, so I choke down the unsavory words for fear of being the guest who fumbles with the finery at the table and dribbles wine down the front of my shirt. Afraid I would forget my manners in the house of God and rip into the bread with white knuckle fists like it was life and gulp down the wine like my tongue was on fire. We're practiced at nibbling tiny digestible bites and taking the daintiest of sips, patting at our lips with a crisp white linen napkin. But we all come famished for grace. There is no other way to be filled. We are all beggars. Some of us just clean up better. That's it. That's our message. That's our witness. Frankly, I wish somebody else would do it. I don't want to do it. But nobody else is bad enough because they don't know it. And so our message is, y'all come. All y'all come. It's about forgiveness and mercy and love. That's all we've got. You think about that. Amen.